Man muss so ein bisschen sich einfach die History von den Fights angucken, dann sieht man da schon mal ein Rein. Freedom, collaboration, transparency. Do you all here believe in those values? Come on, it was supposed to be an open source summit. Do you believe in those values like freedom, collaboration? Do you believe that open source projects you are working on are cool and important for the world? Oh, yes, yes, but I see some guys here not raising their hand. Um, given the number of people who believe in open source in their project, um, unfortunately, I have to give you some warning. You may... You may live now, live now, and live a happy life you have lived, or you can stay with me with a former open source developer who abandoned the development a couple of years ago and learned what I have learned in the so-called business world. Bear in mind the associated risk. You may wake up tomorrow wearing a suit, which is not a big deal, and but worst of all, doing PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> and not because you were asked to do, but because you believe that it is the right thing, the best thing you could do for your project. On the other hand, if you are curious enough to stay with me, we will look at the open source software from a completely different perspective, from the perspective of value and money, from the perspective where open source can show it's ugly face. There is only one problem with that. Human mind, because human mind is a pattern recognition mechanism. And it can recognize only what it has been recognized, or what, it, what it has been taught to recognize, just like in this case. Who of you can see a man playing a saxophone? And who of you can see a female face? Pretty much, pretty good. The thing is uh, that this is just a picture, and with business, it's way more complicated because there is no definite answer. Never. We are always making assumption and guessing. In this in this atom, uh, in this presentation, I will try to show you a couple of interesting uses of open source. But before we get there, I shall introduce you to the Bill Corbacher. This is the main person on this picture. Um, I like this picture very much because photographers are pretty much like developers. They, are, they have certain <laughs> skills and they are trying to do their job the best way they can. And this one here was hanging around this race trying to make a photo of his life. Instead of making a photo of his life, he became a subject of someone else's photo of his life. <laughs> Situational awareness is a term that is used to describe the ability to understand what is going around us and what is going to happen in the future. The point is that if you could, if, if you could, if you could consider for a second that your flight control room hasn't been trained in situational awareness, you would be terrified. But you know what, your managers, directors haven't been trying in predicting what can, what can happen in their business. Therefore, most of the business is done uh, using this approach, which is basically, let's bombard the hills because 67% of other generals has been successful by bombarding hills. It is just good feeling, mean copying, and a little of understanding what's going uh, what's going around us. It's the right of action, and I'm here to say that doing the right thing is far more important than doing it right. We are all, like this photographer, Bill Corbat. We have the right skills, we are usually at the right time, but we fail to perform because we don't really understand what is going around us. Some of you may say I'm exaggerating, but the fact is that 85% of IT projects, not just open source, but IT in general, fails to deliver value. Those, those are not projects that don't complete, don't complete on time, or, don't, don't, or, or aren't 
completed with an assumption that our project that were perfectly executed, but nobody cared. Have you maybe heard of an open mocha company that has created the, one of the first um, iPhone killers back in 2007? I know that you did, or some one person did. Um, the, the thing is that they wanted to create an open hardware, open software phone that would be software developer friendly. And they have focused so much on being open and on being developer friendly that they have implemented the most important feature a phone should have, that is a shell console in 2007. Because everyone knows that ordinary people need to have a shell console. <laughs> <laughs> Even if setting up Wi-Fi network took an hour, this is Debian based, and setting up the phone a week or so. On the other hand, the most basic functionality was totally broken. There was no support for text messages. The end call button would not always end the call, end the call, but there was a workaround. The screen was always on, when you would, so if you put your phone to your head, you could end the call with your ear. It kind of worked. I, well, right now I should give you the choice. If you were about to choose in 2007, which solution would you prefer? A closed source iPhone run by, by a company, not, nearly, not necessarily the same, or the open, mocha, open hardware, open so software phone. Which one would be your choice? Hands up who's for open mocha. <laughs> okay, a couple of questions. <laughs> I will not ask the other question, I will just say, this is not how consumers have voted. And this is, I think, one of the most important points in this presentation. Open source value, oh, sorry, open source as such will not bring you any sales. It's not a sales point. It's just barely a secondary product attribute. First of all, you have to have the primary functionality implemented, and then you can compete with, al with alternative solutions based on using open source as your advantage. The project, the projects in general, don't fail because of problems with governance. Because if you try, you can finally solve it. We, you can get it right or at sufficiently right. It's not the matter of financing, but we will talk about it later. The primary cause of the problem mm -hmm. is the user need ignorance. This, I don't know where this photo was taken. The point is that this yeah. specific... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have learned this the hard way. I have run a couple of projects that I shouldn't be running. I have wasted a couple of people, a couple of man years time. And now I'm teaching others how to avoid mistakes, which is to projects, projects like this. And there are three simple steps that can help with running a project. Um, the step number one is to understand your user needs. It's as trivial as that. The question is, what do you mean by the user need? When uh, one of the bands that was receiving the training around this was asked, what's your need? The answer of the board was, be profitable. Of course, being profitable is not a thing that drives, the, uh, I mean, it's a purpose of running a company or an organization, but it doesn't attract community, it doesn't attract the users. If I'm interested in drinking a cup of tea, I want to get a cup of tea and I don't care if it is open source. The step number two is to understand what do you need to provide to get this user need satisfied. So it's as simple as, if you want to provide a cup of tea, you need tea, hot water, and a cup. If you need tea, sorry, if you need Hot water, you need some water, kettle, and electricity, and because this is an open source presentation, we will provide our own electricity, and we have some battery, and battery requires some other software. This diagram is a simple value chain diagram, which can be quite interesting, especially if we add here 
the visibility axis or value axis because what's on the top is important for the user. What's on the bottom, where we usually are, is invisible and end users don't care for that. Now, the thing is that money flow from the top till, uh, till down because the user pays for service. The service provider needs to pay for own components. And basically, every component behaves like a glass, trying to gather as much money as possible. <laughs> kind of simplified, but we'll do, but we'll do for now. Um, this, of course, begs for question how open source, which doesn't earn, exists in that value chain at all. We will get, we will get there soon, but first we need to introduce the concept of evolution. And have you maybe noticed that some things get popular, um, uh, we are very excited about them, and then they get boring and kind of cost of doing business. This is actually this is actually predictable, not in time, but in terms of how all activities will change. Everything which starts as new, novel, exciting, unpredictable, and uh, most of all, without current knowledge, just an experiment. We are doing something to show it is possible, but whether it will be commercialized or not. We don't know. Ends up, sorry, ends up as being all well known, used by everyone in the industry, and without much value. It's like I can't see anyone you here being excited, excited about electricity, right? It has been a thing a hundred and fifty years ago, but it's not anymore. Computing power goes the same way, and I would call this. I mean, I, it's not me, but this process is called evolution. I wanted to show you maybe it's, uh, something interesting. Do you know what it is? This is the first digital camera created in 1970. It took 30 years before it got commercialized and ubiquitous, so now everyone, everyone got one. Mm -hmm. Of course, this process of evolution isn't as straightforward as I have mentioned because we have four phases and all those four phases are precisely named and have certain characteristics. But the point is that we can take our value chain at the evolution axis which binds together the maturity and the number of different attributes. We can reassign components and what we get is a world lemma. Now we are getting to software. Let's imagine for a second that we are a battery provider company. The battery company provide, the battery provider company ships batteries and <coughs> in addition to the physical device there is some software. If you run this if you would run this company, which software would you use? Open source or closed source one? But battery needs some management and is that being uh, broken cells, stuff like that? If it's good enough, you use the open source one. The, the, if it's good. It's good enough. That's kind of a right answer. But the fact is that you should compare the cost of open source software and the closed source software. And there are four major attributes which matter, which is how much does it cost to get a license, to support the software, to get the knowledge, and how much does it cost to exit from the open source software. And if we did that, we would have discovered that it is actually not important because 67% of companies doesn't track the cost of using open source software. Bear in mind what I have just said. Thanks to some dumbass that believes that empty cell in a spreadsheet means zero, for majority of companies, using open source doesn't cost a dime. Which means that for an architect or for a developer, the difference between open source and closed source software is really bit long, a couple of minutes, or feeling a poor case order and getting a license process in weeks, months, or even longer if it's a corporation. It means that the primary advantage of open source is how fast it spreads through market. 
because the entry, the barrier entry is low. And some companies use it on purpose. We'll get back to the Android versus iOS battle, but this is to show how this is this chart shows you how the open source adoption affects the um, how the fact of being open source affects the market adoption of a certain product. Now, as a company, to answer the question I had asked earlier, as a company providing batteries, you will prefer to use the open source software because it's just cheaper to start with. The question is, what about all the other costs? What about contributing back? Will you contribute back? You will in the beginning when the software is unstable because you don't want to maintain your own fork. As, as, as software becomes more and more major, you will be tempted to withdraw all the developers because it's no longer a competitive advantage and we will end up with strategy of commons. This is a software that should never be created as an open source software because it has no business model and it's actually using volunteers to survive. Volunteers which are not paid work for the public good, which is, which is great for them, but from the business point of view, it's something that shouldn't have happened. If you are in such a situation, your only bet is to find someone who cares, which usually is the company that benefits from the project the most, and convince them that they should support the project. As a reason, we get forks of uh, forks run by private companies, which are not necessarily as open as was the original um, original software. Now, this is strategy of commons, but there is a use case where the strategy of commons is used on purpose to exit a business that failed to earn money. There are three steps required to exit the business. I'm sorry, to exit. First of all, we, firm, we fail to earn money out of a certain solution. Then we open source it, and then we withdraw developers. As simple as that. Now, there are two examples I can think of, just out of um, on the top of my head. It's Symbian OS, which you probably have heard about. about and it's Java. For Symbian, Nokia failed to earn money on it. For Java, not only Sun failed to make money out of it, but even Oracle failed to make enough of money out of it. They have both open source the project. And now, the step I'm waiting of, the step that has happened for Symbian, and I'm waiting to happen for Java, is the developer reassignment. The Java will probably end up as a community maintain as a community software without serious maintainer, and I hope a company like Red Hat or maybe IBM will contribute to Java instead instead of Oracle. Now, slightly different situation. If you would be a cloud provider, which one is would be more important for you? Software, regardless of whether it is closed or open source software, or physical cloud. Computers, servers, rooms, cooling, internet cables, stuff like that. Which would, assume you are a cloud provider, this is the service you, you sell, this is something that people don't see in the first place. The answer is, for you, the most important asset is the one the others can't replicate. Right? So if this would be open source, then the computing center is important for you. If this would have open source competition, the computing center is important for you, physical device. And this explains why we can see a sudden change in the last couple of years. Here, Linux is doing great. Microsoft knows there is not a lot of money in this space of um, operating systems, and it knows that there is a lot of money to be taken from building cloud and computing centers. So 
This is not accidental. Microsoft knows where our money and that is doing everything to drive the cloud adoption up. Actually, this wasn't always the, um, the only possible choice because back in 2010, Facebook attempted to create an open source version of a computing center. This was, I think it is, this project is still alive. It, uh, it contains a specification of how to build your own um, data center, a shameless attack on Amazon a couple of years too late executed. Now, we are getting to back, we are getting back to deliver value and to the open source. Um, this is a scenario very often played by Amazon. Imagine we have a user which want to, wants to play games. In order to write a computer game, we need a game engine. And game engine requires some server-side computing. What does Amazon? Amazon uses open approach, releases its software, its game engine, Lumber AI, as open source in the hope that over time money will flow to the cloud. Game engine, the open game engine will be the only dominating engine in the, uh, in the world out there and all games will be based on the open source solution because as we have said, companies don't track the cost of open source adoption. What does it leave? It leaves plenty of dead other commercial engines possibly with um, that, uh, with that companies. And for Amazon, it's a standard, it's a significant cloud usage, and if it is a standard, this business is protected, money are flowing here, Amazon ends, and therefore it can sponsor the open source development. And standards cannot be changed, as many of you have learned. But we have to preserve backward compatibility this is a very nice picture taken in Sweden, I don't remember which year, when they have attempted to transition from the left and that traffic to the right and at one Sunday at noon. It was a chaos that took a number of, uh, of days to fix and this is the reason why the United Kingdom is still left-handed. It just takes too much money to transition from one standard to other. So, if if you manage to establish a standard, an open source standard that drives money to your business, you have one. Now, about AI engines, AI engines, it's pretty much similar situation. We have different players. We have Google and Microsoft and maybe a little bit Amazon. We have, they are all cloud providers and they are publishing their AI engines as open source with the hope that once this becomes major, people will be bound to their computing power. The money is here. So, to maybe summar summarize this, this stuff, there are three important aspects of a successful open source software. It's contributing to the user need. It doesn't have to be direct user. It may be a customer of customer or customer of customer of customer, etc. But the open source has to contribute to the real value. Open source to increase adoption and invisible constraint to get money. Because there must be something that will drive money to, to our business. Now, this scenario is repeatable, again, about Amazon, or maybe Google. If Google manages to um, make AI engine more major and de and facto standard, what will happen? What will happen is there will be new solutions based on the artificial intelligence um, that will help everyday life. What will then the cloud provider do? Will pick up the best candidate from experimental solutions and make it nature. We'll leave plenty of dead, uh, dead bodies here, but we'll build so-called tower because now taking customers from the core business will require new competitor to rebuild this entire stock. Which is pretty much at some point impossible. We will probably sooner get uh, government stepping in and saying what is the standard, what is it not like it is right now with the electricity. Now, similar scenario was attempted by European Union 
and, uh, and the area of access to bank accounts. I know we are in Germany and you are pretty good with banking systems, but it, that's not the case in the whole Europe. We had aggregation software that was trying to use access API, not always existing, to get the information that are on the, your bank account. What the European Union did, it tried to make this a standard and accessible for all. The problem is that banks don't own uh, the whole stock, so those banks who will come up with useful software um, aggregation of multiple accounts, delivering uh, personal loans when you need them, will be able to isolate other banks. It's quite interesting times ahead, maybe not really related to open source, besides that the open source standard is used as a way to isolate underlying providers. Once you do that, you can switch providers as you wish. Now, the thing is, the second most important thing I have to say about open source is that open source works if you know what you are doing. The thing is, maybe you have heard about this, maybe not, open source can kill your competition, like in the case shown by Amazon, or it can kill you. The Copperhead OS is a fork of Android, slightly more secure, that was released in the beginning uh, under, I think, GPL. Yes, under GPL. So they made this business model we will deliver an open source secure system, more secure than a stock Android, and people will pay us a, a license fee. What happened is that the competitors started selling more secure forms they did they, than they did. Open sourcing a critical business advantage is definitely not a business model. You don't want to open source everything. So they went and changed the license to something less permissive, and then it didn't work well for them to, you know. If there is a certain business practice, it's very difficult to change. Now, we can look at other companies which try to open source everything, and then they were hit by aggressive force. CentOS was a community, uh, CentOS was a community version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And not many of you know that Oracle Linux, I think, was built from, from the same sources as the Red Hat Linux. This is one of the biggest, uh, let's say, this is one of the things that I would like Red Hat to be better at. And this is one of the reasons why I have left it, because not everything should be, should be open source. Now, countermeasures. If you are using open source to heal someone's business, of course there are countermeasures. It's intellectual property. If you are using open source, the other party can sue you. It doesn't matter whether the lawsuit is legal, is justified or not. What it matters is that it buys time. I don't have to present that. Uh, a couple of slides earlier, we have seen Microsoft loves Linux. And on the other hand, Microsoft is still signing patent coverage portfolio exchanges with other, with other companies, which is pretty much like in getting money from intellectual property. It's copyright. You probably know that Apache is a copyrighted word. You know that Eclipse is a copyrighted word. So if you want to use that software, you have to rewrite it and remove that single, that single word. Otherwise, some, you will receive a nice letter from lawyers that will tell you you have no right to ship that software. And finally, one of the ugliest, most dirtiest tactics you could imagine is using open source against open source. We, okay, so imagine a scenario when we have Apple again in 2007 shipping their iPhone and releasing their iOS as an open source operating system. Other people are, or other companies are using that operating system to make their own phones and then after a couple of years Apple does everything 
to crash at projects. It creates strategy of commons. It's not really responsive to maintenance. maintenance. It is suing people who adopted the software. And that way, through the usage of open software, the company could protect itself from Android. It would suck out the entire development will for an open source mobile operating system. It is possible, certainly it is. The problem is that one cannot, cannot never say whether such moves on the market are done or pur on purpose or out of plain stupidity. Now, the true genius, the true genius is really indistinguishable with um, certain lack of skills. Now, what I have shown you, it is just a small set of possible plays in the strategy in general um, set, set of moves. And before we will move to the Q&A, the technique I have presented is called worldly mapping. It was invented by Simon Wardley. It's available for free. It creates great commons, so you can read about it and check whether you like it or not. I do work for a leading edge forum, and my name is Krzysztof Daniel, by the way. Uh, I work as a strategy consultant, and if you are too lazy to read all the blogs and all the materials that are out there, there is a course I have assembled, and with this code you will get 50% off. So now, time for questions. <laughs>